but we're all dedicated to dedicated to making sure that our friends that were up in the Hilton got out that the war ended I'm not sure how much of a part we had in that, but I do know we had a small part in that by taking the, the fight to the enemy's backyard by being willing to go wherever he wanted to go helped in that war now one of the things you had to have flying with us in the places that we went not a lot of sane people would go and I guess we were a bunch of crazies with some of the stuff we pulled flying over their runways flying down their runways going through their SAM sites we all had surface to air missiles come up close enough that you can see the graffiti on it And you still had to get the mission done. And yeah, to set that incident in time aside, this chance that you could have been blown away in a heartbeat, set that aside and go on with it. Because the mission still had to get done. I was flying up by Yen Bai one day with a guy named Sid Hudson. Sid and uh, was a real practical joker, always had a sense of humor. And we were up by Yen Bai, it was, uh, there was nothing there. Intel had told us that no SAM sites there, it was a pretty clear area. The Red River made a big omega in the, on the ground as it flowed around the runway. So it was very easy to see. We were using it for a holding pattern. And we are just outbound, waiting for our time to go into to, uh, the targets. And we were turned outbound, and, Normally we kept the jammers in standby because they tended to talk to each other. So we were just bollygagging <coughs> around, not paying much attention to anything because it's a safe area. And all of a sudden, my electronic gear in the cockpit goes full up, shows me I've got a SAM in the air, and it's on us. And I reach down and turn both jammers on and look up at my uh, the element lead, who's about six or seven, eight ship lists away not very far away, and in between him and me is a surface to air missile, followed very shortly by his friend. There were two of them. Either missile that had blown would have gotten both airplanes. Both missiles blew high after they passed through the flight, because I guess we blocked their, uh, their detonation command, and when we finally got to it, it was too late. But after that, I mean, that, that'll blow your mind to, to come that close to death twice and not get a scratch. Yeah. The mission still had to go on. And it did. Except that Sydney wasn't very, he said the humor left. He uh, you know, was pretty serious the rest of the mission. But we got on and took care of it care of business. You know, we had a very dedicated crew over there, and it didn't matter what your background was, where you came from. We were all there at the right time, the right place, and we could get the job done. We were all 100% American. A large part of the squadron did not come home. Luckily, when the release of prisoners, a lot of them came out of the Hanoi you know, we had a good group. A good group of Americans, just like you are. Because we come from all walks of life. And we're still very much dedicated to that principle. The principles that we started this country with, and the principles that this country still exists for. It's freedom and democracy. And that hasn't changed. Well, I've probably talked enough. We had some <clears throat> good experiences there, some bad experiences, some experiences that we enjoy rem remembering, and some that we would just soon forget. But we were all 100% dedicated to this country. 
that hasn't changed, it won't change. And our job today is to make sure that that gets carried on to our, those that follow us. Because it's people like you that make this the greatest country in this world. So without you, there is nothing. And that's what we're here for. To make sure that our ancestors, what they gave us, is passed on. Because it's very worthwhile if that happens. The freedom of the whole world looks to us with a gleam in their eye. When they think about the United States. Thank you. similar air combat training is uh, an everyday thing in the Air Force. Uh, if you look at the formations and some of the tactics that we used in those days, we probably would not repeat those today. Uh, we learned later that we were using pretty much a Korean War, gun-only environment type tactics in a missile environment air to air missile environment. And uh, I don't think you'd find those kinds of formations being briefed in today's briefing rooms for air to air environment. We, because of the fuel restrictions that I mentioned and the electronic countermeasure uh, requirements, we normally didn't have half of the missile loads on the airplanes that the airplane was designed to carry. On this 10th of May mission in particular, I was carrying two AIM-7 radar missiles and one heat-seeking missile. The airplane was designed to carry four radar missiles, four heat-seeking missiles, and in the D-model's uh, case, a gun pod if necessary. This is after the war had been on for some seven or eight years, and we didn't have full loads of uh, weapons probably a different story than what uh, we saw in the desert, storm desert here. The commanders, uh, as General Ritchie mentioned, General Boat made that decision to cancel that strike package, at least the target that day, and move it under probably a tremendous amount of pressure. I don't think that war was being uh, targeted from Saigon necessarily. Uh, if you compare that with what I believe happened in uh, the desert where the executive branch told the Department of Defense, you're trained, you've got the material, here's the objective, go do it. And they did an impressive job. Uh, I think you can see a lesson learned there from uh, the government. 
as we downsize the military, some of uh, some of us and some of those who lived through these different experiences and have seen those lessons learned uh, will not be part of the active force. But uh, it will be interesting to observe in the in the future that if those lessons learned remain and continue to be learned. I appreciate the support of you folks coming out this morning. I hope that uh, that you'll have some questions for us and that we can provide some information that will be interesting to you. But also for those of you that probably worked at Hill Air Force Base and worked on those F-4s and, uh, and tweaked the landing gear and the radar and all that kind of stuff, uh, guys, thanks for being Appreciate it. Couldn't have done it without you, you know that. Thank you. That kind of makes me dangerous at all times. As my wife said last night, you know, you've got to watch school teachers because they always repeat things three times. And that's awesome. <laughs> but uh, they've really said it all, these uh, fine gentlemen that I have the, the privilege of flying with in, in Southeast Asia. But, you know, one of the greatest moments of my life was coming back to Hill, where uh, a few years ago I was a deputy at uh, MAM. And I came to really appreciate a statement that was told to me many years before that uh, mission and people are one and the same. And uh, I got a better appreciation of what it took to actually create a flying machine and keep, keep it flying. I had been a maintenance officer before I was a flyer, so I came to appreciate that. And uh, as I stressed with the reservists last night at uh, the conference that they were having, with the downsizing that we're having with American forces uh, in all parts of the Department of Defense, we have reservists and guardsmen and uh, civil service corps that are taking on that extra load to make our, our, our country viable defense-wise. As Thomas Jefferson once said, that eternal, vig eternal vigilance is a price of liberty, and we can't really forget that. And I have another hero of mine that I'll leave a saying with you that uh, happened right after World War II. And it's something that we can never forget as Americans, and I know you won't. The very fact that you're here shows your interest in uh, reliving history. For many years, I didn't speak about uh, the uh, Southeast Asia conflict because it wasn't something that people spoke about unless you were talking to somebody that he had lived out with you. But there was a fellow by the name of Winston Churchill that once said, and uh, I've always taken to heart and tried to reflect upon when, when you have cases like this, when we start to downsize our military, in the fact of, in the, in the face of what uh, General Ritchie says, uh, still a clear and present danger. But uh, Winston Churchill once said that in time of danger and not before, we have, we have soldiers out there and, and we have uh, forces out there that are dedicated to their country. But you know, it's, it's during war that we actually focus on the warrior, as we do a policeman in society. But it's only in time of danger and not the war. And after the war and conflict and all things are righted, usually God is forgotten and the soldier is slighted. So we should always remember that although we may have done a few fantastic things up there over North Vietnam, there are many other people that uh, were just as courageous on the ground and in the air and in the supply shops. And this has gone on throughout America's history and will continue to go on. And it's only through your support as American citizens that we'll continue to keep our country strong. So thank you for the opportunity. I'm sure that you have questions. Perhaps maybe the board just uh, would like to stand and take an interview or ask, uh, ask questions directly to you. Uh, sir, General, what was the normal range when you were able to see the MiGs and have a chance to shoot them down? Well, the, uh, <coughs> it was uh, limited by the weapons. Actually, we, we had special equipment on board at that time, APX-81, and uh, still have that today. You had an F-15. Yeah. Um, and I 
one was hit uh, Luke, just a couple of days ago, and they still have the ABX-81 on the airplanes on the ramp right now. But we could identify the MiGs up to what, about 200, 200 uh, miles? Uh, uh, 150, 150, 200 miles away. We could identify them on the yeah, yeah. Yeah, electronically, not radar. And then, as a practical matter, we could get them on the radar. We could get a lock up, uh, whole, probably 15, 20 miles in those days. And we could do that head on. In fact, we could even fire head on in those days. Um, and we had to make absolutely sure that uh, the cardinal rule was that there were no friendlies in the forward firing sector. But on the 10th of May, the Oyster mission, we were first in, and we've done quite a bit of planning on that mission. Uh, the MiGs were orbiting in the vicinity of about uh, 15,000 feet west of Hanoi, and then they were coming out of that orbit as the strike flight came in. They were coming out to attack. So we went in low level and orbited uh, close to the ground about uh, 20, 30 miles south uh, west of Hanoi. Um, got the MiGs on our uh, electronic uh, detection equipment, and as they came out of their orbits, we popped up uh, Bob Lodge and John fired first head on at what about seven miles, John? You can see. Five, around five or six miles. Uh, and uh, two kills head off uh, without a visual. And uh, then uh, Chuck and I and uh, Tommy Fiesel uh, were able to get in and get to one of the other mix. So we, as uh, Chuck mentioned earlier, three out of four that day, but uh, and then we had one loss. And that's not a good exchange. But so back to the original question, uh, we could electronically detect the mix way out. Uh, we could get a radar lock on in the vicinity of 20 miles. But uh, most of the engagements in those days were visual. Another thing that a lot of people don't realize is that uh, there are quantum leaps in technology uh, by both sides doing that conflict. A lot of people assume that we're going up against villagers with sticks and with AK-47s, but uh, they had technology. In spite of the fact that they had an older aircraft, uh, they were constantly doing a one-upsmanship. One uh, after a while, they got to know that uh, we were able to interrogate their systems, which caused them to have a warning light in their cockpit, which would give them an indication that, you know, we had really targeted them for something. And after a while, they got creative too, so that they started to do what we call uh, no lock-on type intercepts with their own uh, ground radar units, so that uh, we uh, had no idea that they were out there when there was no inter interrogation taking place. We said, well, they must be there, but they were there. And uh, frequently, they would, uh, another tactic they would use would be to send up uh, a flight of less experienced crews sometimes in big 21s and then put their ace in an older big 19 and then just uh, get you uh, get you out there in a flight where you said wow look at all those enemy aircraft let's go charge after them and then some uh, war hero and they did have aces by the way a lot of these did have aces would come up from the weeds and shoot down the planes in the flight so it was a constant uh, a constant awareness. You had to be very aware of the fact that you couldn't necessarily rely yourself on the electronic environment. In fact, frequently we went up north silent, literally turning things off because every emission that you make from your aircraft can be detected somewhere along the line. So frequently we went silent because we didn't want to be detected ourselves. And so there was this tip to tap went on all the time, all the time, between, uh, uh, both sides. What model uh, MiG 21s are you flying against? Like L's or P's? Oh, they were early models. The C, I think it was C's. The earlier ones were C's, and we got they got some J's in with uh, bigger engines, more pylons on them, an internal gun, and they were faster. And you frequently take off uh, during a strike, and they fly to China you know, for for their own little uh, respite and uh, security, and much of their training would come from. Uh, not only the Soviets, but the Chinese and the North Koreans. Too. They're very good aviators. Uh, did you use sidewinders, and how close do you have to get to, when you release them? Well, we carried sidewinders. Uh, I, I never used a sidewinder. I always I used a sparrow. I think John Madden used, used a sidewinder. Yeah, we used two uh, sidewinders uh, when you were with him. Yeah. And we got. Uh, 
A lot depends on the maneuvering. If it's a non-maneuvering target, you can go out to 9, 12,000, 15,000 feet, especially if you're high and fast. If you've got a maneuvering target, especially a high one, highly maneuvering target, you've got to get in a lot closer. And when we were up on this particular mission, uh, like was mentioned earlier, we had D-models. And although a D-model could carry a gun, we needed a gasoline horse and we needed a gun. So we carried a centerline fuel tank that we usually dropped off the plane after we went over what we call the fence, which was the You're you saying E-model e sidewinder? No, no, I'm saying that the gun in the F-4, yeah. the F-4 models that we were initially flying before the Easter Offensive of 1972 were D-models. And as a result, they didn't have an internal gun. They carried external fuel tanks instead. So that reduced our munition flow. And generally speaking, we just carried aim sirens and some aim uh, fours that usually uh, weren't very reliable. So we, were, we had very minimum munitions on board until, uh, until the North Vietnamese started to come over the border. And we brought over three TDY squadrons from the United States, one from Clark and one from Eglin and one from Homestead. They were there for six months, and they were fighting alongside us. And so we grew from a wing of two fighter squadrons and a reconnaissance squadron to one with five fighter squadrons, where we were wing tip to wing tip uh, during uh, the latter parts of 1972 when we started going over the north. In that way, on a daily basis, we could be uh, scheduled to fly either a D model or be lucky enough to fly an E model that had an internal gun that would give you a little more, more of a comfortable feeling if you ran out of. Uh, you know, bombs and somebody started chasing you around that you'd have somebody to defend yourself with. Yeah, sidewinders we did carry, they were primarily M9Es, and then we got in some M9Js that we put on the leader. However, as a leader, I really preferred the BMD, and the reason was it had the APX-81, the combat tree equipment, and that gave us the electronic capability to identify the mix at a long range, which was extremely important. One advantage we had, too, is that the Navy was in the Gulf, and uh, they had picket ships out there with uh, uh, translators on board. And that was quite uh, invaluable to us, because we could tell, uh, generally speaking, what the motives were of, uh, of the enemy when they decided to take off and where they were going and, and what, their, you know, what their destinations were, what their intentions were. So that helped out. They had translators on board and able to interrogate their own uh, communications channels. Was there many times that uh, you were in a position where guns would have done you any good? Uh, was, was, was a gun missed in, in the early going in the F-4? Sure. So there, there were close engagements where you feel that they would have uh, created well, kills? I don't, you know, it's, it's one of these kind of things where if you've got a leader out there, and uh, as Bob Lodge was, and we're number two, and we're following in trail, and you have a MiG-19 between you, you're all out of missiles, no gun, or even if you have a missile. fuel, and you could have done something about it, and all we could do is provide mutual support. Now that MiG-19 driver, who also had a wingman that was flying our wing, had no idea that we couldn't do anything. So our mutual support was invaluable that but technically we could, have done, we could have done nothing to prevent that shoot down of our leader, but a gun would have helped out. See, I had just come in uh, when I came to Udorn in 72, come from the weapons school at Nellis, where uh, our primary weapon was gun, then heat-seeking missile, then radar missile. And that was the order in which we ranked the armament that we had and the way we trained. So when I first got to Udorn, Charlie Gabriel said uh, we were short of weapons school graduates, which is the reason I was actually diverted to Udorn. So uh, Charlie Gabriel, the wing commander, asked me if I thought uh, the gun or the missile should be the primary weapon. I said, well, of course, the gun. But, and then later, due to the tactics that the MiGs were flying at that time, they were generally hit and run. They liked to come in high, low, sneak up behind the supersonic, very hard to see, hard to detect, and fire their heat-seeking missile. And they could fire when they were supersonic. They could fire at about two miles. And it's almost impossible to see one of them outside of two miles, particularly in the rear quarter. And so generally they like to hit and run. And they didn't like to get in close to gun range. And so that's why uh, as time went on, uh, we developed the strategy, strategy of using the Sparrow missile as the primary weapon, then the heat-seeking missile, and then the gun. But the gun was very important as we, as we, as we discussed. It was, it was important to have that range of capability. We're very lucky though in many cases uh, 
the enemy had a heat-seeking missile, so uh, our crew survival rate was a little higher than theirs was because if you got shot down with a uh, with heat-seeking missile, the chances are it went up your, your tail end and you had a chance to uh, get to a position where you could bail out if you were shot down, where uh, the average North Vietnamese that saw an AIM-7 heading its way, uh, pretty worried because he never knew whether he was going to be hit in the cockpit, in the wing, and there are cases, documented cases, where the enemy actually bailed out of the aircraft before they were hit. But there was a no escape zone, yeah, that's right, uh, for the uh, AIM-7. Yeah. Uh, if it uh, fired it in parameters or in certain conditions, if it worked, uh, the enemy couldn't get, get away. The problem is when we got there in the UNAR in 72, the kill rate, the PK rate, of the AIM-7 was about 11. In other words, 11 out of 100, which is very poor. We spent a lot of time, as Chuck mentioned, working with uh, the missile crews, the load crews, the arming crews, the radar people, uh, the avionics people, and uh, we made sure that the crews operating the uh, missile knew exactly how to employ it. And as a result, we had about a 55% success rate with our missiles. So it made a dramatic difference. And it was that interaction, that team effort, uh, working together that uh, made it possible for us to have real good success for this fire. Very complicated missile, though. Uh, in fact, after trigger squeeze, there was a second and a half before the missile even came off the airplane. So you know, you squeeze the trigger and nothing happens. Oh my goodness, you squeeze it again, even though you knew that it was a second and a half of lead. That was okay, because you wanted to get two committed anyway, particularly if you had a good shot. You always wanted to get two in the air for a better chance of a, of a, of a hit. Uh, but there were about 93 electronic and pneumatic steps that had to take place in sequence inside the missile after trigger squeeze. Now that's after a four second delay from lock on to trigger squeeze. After radar lock on, we had to wait four seconds for what we called uh, uh, radar settling and missile matchup time. The computers and the radar and the missile had to match up and that all took about four seconds. That's a long, long time in an air battle. So it's five and a half seconds if you do everything right from lock on to missile in the air. Of course, we're talking about steam-powered systems. It scares the hell out of you when it comes off the rail because the chances are you've never seen it happen. And you might say, well, that's only four seconds. That four seconds is an eternity. <laughs> then you say, will it work? <laughs> did any of you gentlemen ever encounter any foreign advisors, air advisors such as Soviet, Cuban, North Korea? It's our squadron commander, wasn't it? <laughs> as far as we know, the uh, Soviets were not flying combat. We know they were flying training missions and test missions. In fact, one time uh, there was a special intelligence report.